Hello students, welcome to EPG Patshala and my name is DK Bhattacharya. We will be talking today about upper Paleolithic culture of Europe. As usual, we will not look at Europe as one unit, but having four eco-cultural zones. The part which is west of the river Rhine, that means including Spain and Portugal, France and England, will come together as Western Europe. Central Europe is a larger landmass. It will include Poland, it will include Germany, Czechoslovakia, Switzerland, uh, Switzerland um, Italy, uh, Hungary um, and Austria. A part of southeast of part of Europe, which is known as Balkans, include Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, erstwhile Yugoslavia, today there are several countries, Serbia, Croatia, Montenegro, and of course then Greece. The part which is east of this landmass is called Eastern Europe, which basically contains Romania, Ukraine, Bul Belarus, and White Russia. Having said as much as the four eco-cultural zones, let us look at the development of upper Paleolithic culture of Western Europe. It need not be overemphasized the fact that the terms, the development of concept or understanding of the whole thing of upper Paleolithic or middle Paleolithic or even the lower Paleolithic began in Western Europe. So obviously the terms are used from Western Europe. For instance, Gabriel de Motilet who gave the terms Perigordian, uh, Ordignation, Solutrean, Magdalenian, they are all places and sites of France. The same way you have sites, uh, uh, concepts uh, of middle Paleolithic, upper Paleolithic, everything from France. So when you talk about Western Europe, it definitely has antiquity of larger expense of studies, a larger duration of studies than the rest of the part of Europe. Let us take a site called Logery Hout. Logery Hout is a site in Lazy's village and it is a very big rock shelter. In fact, there are two wings of it, Logery Hout 1 or Logery Hout 2 and it is called Logery Hout East or Logery Hout West. But anyway, Logery Hout is a site which has been excavated by a man called D.P. Roni. He was the director of Lazy's museum. But before he excavated it, Dorothea Garrett, who is a lady from England, he, she had come to uh, France and said, look, your upper Paleolithic, you said there are four traditions, Aurignitian, Solutrean, Magdalenian. There are three traditions, Aurignitian, Solutrean, Magdalenian. She said, Aurignitian, which is the earliest of upper Paleolithic in Western Europe, doesn't seem to be a very homogenized uh, trait or homogenized tradition. She said, I would like to divide it in three groups. And she gave the name uh, Shuttle Peronian, Aurignitian, and Gravitian. So what was then called by Gabriel de Mortillet as Aurignitian became three different traditions. Shuttle Peronian was the lower part of it. Aurignitian remained as Aurignitian, which was the middle part of it, and Gravitian, which became the upper part of it. De Peroni, when he excavated Logery Hood, he said no. I would call it a parallel tradition. So Aurignation was divided into two traditions. One was named by De Pironi as Perigordian, and Perigordian and Aurignations were taken as two parallel traditions at the site of Logerio. And they, according to these various layers, he named them as Perigordian 1, Perigordian 2, Perigordian 3, etc., going up to Perigordian 6. The same way Aurignation 1, Aurignation 2, going up to Aurignation 5. So the five, five traditions of Perigordian and Aurignations were found interspersed and occurring in alternate stresses or stratigraphies at Logerio. Good enough. And then there is uh, about six layers which just follows after origination ends and these six layers are called Solutrean layers. And the Solutreans are a very specific culture, we'll talk about it later on. And finally, after Solutrean ends, there is another six layers which is uh, having varieties of characters, we'll talk later on, and this has been named as Magdalenian. So, going back to Gabriel de Mortillet, who gave that lower upper Paleolithic of Western Europe, or Europe at that time, was talking of three traditions, or Ignition, Solutrean, and Magdalenian. 1933, D. Pironi excavated Logery Hood, and he said, no, there are four traditions, Perigordian, Aurignitian, Solutrean, and Magdalenian. And these four traditions were described in detail, and of course, more sites were found, La Madeleine, La Farasse, Parpalo. There are a large number of sites discovered, and there they talked about each of the Perigordian or Aurignitian layers. So let us talk about their cultural traits. Aurignitian. Well, let's take Perigordian first. Though Perigordian is the first cultural layer of Upper Paleolithic after Mousterian ends is Perigordian. So let's take Lower Perigordian. 
lower perigordian is is characterized by blades which are blunted along one border now blunting along one border characterize perigordian in contradistinction to that blades which are not blunted but just retouched in order to make them a little sturdier the working border a little sturdier are called origination so a clear distinction is made in the in the manner of technique of working so perigordian is identified by blades which has been blunted and the blunting border or blunted border meets the opposite sharp border at a very wide angle and this was found at a site called Chateau Perron or Chateau, Chateau Perron and this was called Chateau Perronian knife. Chateau Perronian knife and large number of otherwise burins and end scrapers were identified as a characteristic feature of Perigordian one. Question is if it is occurring right after Mustidian ended is there any Mustidian character in it? The answer is no. There is no Mustidian character found in Perigordian 1. But immediately following this is the Aurignacian 1 and Aurignacian 1 is replete with flake tools. These are not blade tools only, the blade tools appear but there is an overlapping. So you can say it is an indigenous development. You have a development of flake tools continuing with blade tools but these blade tools are detached in a different manner. Let us talk about Perigordian up to the upper Perigordian. Perigordian has six groups, we call them lower Perigordian for a while and the upper ones as upper Perigordian which is just before Solutrean starts. All through Perigordian is very poor in bone tools, there are no bone tools. All along there are huge amount of blade worked with blunting done. Now blunting is a characteristic marker of defining perigordians. So you have a shuttle perin and knife in the lower part and in the uh, in the younger part in the upper perigordian you have the same knife the back backed part meets the sharp border at a young at a lower angle at a low angle so that it becomes a point it's no longer a knife and this point is called gravitation point. In fact, many people call it gravitation phase. So you have a gravitation point characterized in the younger perigordian or upper perigordian and you have a lower perigordian or older perigordian where the, the characteristic type is a, is a per shuttle perigordian and knife. Beyond this, you know, uh, end scrapers and buildings replete. End scrapers and buildings don't have to be worked with backing because they can be worked both in origination as also in uh, perigordian without backing or e with backing. So you have varieties of types which characterize perigordian and this is the mainstay of the largest stay. The perigordian start from around 40,000 and they continue for up to 27,000. So it's a huge duration of perigordians that you find in luxury hood. Let us look at origination. Day one, the first origination, origination one, beautiful bone tools start appearing. Now imagine perigordian originations are more or less occurring coevally at the same time. But originations have beautiful bone points or ivory points, which are called split base lance points. The very beautiful points elongated six to seven centimeter in length and they have a uh, split base, the base is split along the breadth axis and then of course they have varieties of split in the end up to perigord, peri up to origination si 6 or 5 where you find the beveled base points. So you have varieties within them but otherwise also stratigraphically they are different. What are the tool types? You have beautifully retouched blades all along retouched as if it is if you take a bullet and cut it horizontally and you look like a snail. It's a, it's a snail or a bullet cut horizontally and that looks like a type which is very very clear of origination variety and a characteristic variety and it's called origination blade. Origination blade is a blade which is all around retouched including the terminal ends, not only two borders, including the terminal ends. Another type, all along two borders are retouched including terminal end but medially a kind of constriction is created. And rightly, they are also called strangled blade, as if somebody has strangled them in the middle. So they are called strangled blade. Let us look at another side. There is a beautiful building, beautiful building, called Basque building. This is also characteristic of origination type. Very good, it doesn't have a Basque building. So the, what is the Basque building? You, you take a thick flake, and in the thick flake, one of the burin facet is normal inclined facet. The other one is a convex facet. 
a convex facet and this convex facet is obtained by previously making a notch here and then giving a blow and because of the notch this part becomes weak and the force turns convex. So the flake comes out in a convex manner. So this is a very interesting variety and a very specialized variety of burin which is again characteristic of origination and not perigodian. Let us look at the third point. Third point is also very interesting. A core end scraper is made. A nodulus core is taken, a kind of a slice is taken off and then along the border a end scraper form is formed. So it is, it is more or less like a push plane, a push plane, uh, in, in French it is called rabot. Then you have a kind of flat area and a huge end scraper so that you can push it on along the wooden floor or wherever you are trying to work with. This is called carinated end scraper. Again, a carinated end scraper is not found in uh, perigordian but it is found in origination. So here are two very distinct parallel development after Mousterian ends. Upper Paleolithic begins and mind you Upper Paleolithic begins with only one race and the race is called Homo sapiens sapiens. You have Cro-Magnon, Chancellade and Grimaldi all Homo sapiens sapiens and it begins but it begins with two cultures. Now here again you have to accept that if culture change the physical type does not change. The physical type remains the same. Now this is very interesting development <coughs> of Western Europe. And after this parallel development goes on and goes on for up to 27,000 years and then come around 27,000 or 25,000 uh, comes the new culture called Solutrean. Nobody knows where it came from, nobody knows where it went to. It came for only 2,000 years, suddenly it came, suddenly it died. And these 2,000 years there are three or four layers of Solutrean. Of course the name comes from the site called La Saluter, but uh, this is also geographically uh, uh, found in a very small area. The small area is between Garo and Loire. There are two rivers, Garo and Loire, and between these two rivers and a small distribution area. So Salutrian is not only in terms of time limited for only 2000 years, in time of distribution also. In terms of distribution also, it is located in a very small area. It is a very enigmatic culture. Nobody knows why it developed, where from it came and where it go. Let us look at the culture. 9 to 11 centimeter long, beautiful flakes have been taken, sometimes 4 centimeter breadth and both the surfaces have been given pressure flicking and made thin. So it is bifacially worked thin leaf point. They are so thin that they are compared with what is known as laurel leaf. In Greek perhaps you know earning laurels they say. In India you can compare it with what is called tej patta and you can find that these are almost like tej patta or laurel leaf and the nickname is laurel leaf. The technical name is bifacial leaf point. Bifacial leaf point is a characteristic that remains unifacial or partial when it is lower solutrean. In middle solutrean it develops completely into a bifacial leaf point 9 to 4 centi 9 to 4 centimeter in breadth, I am sorry 4 to 5 centimeter in breadth, 9 to 11 centimeter in length and less than 1 centimeter in thickness. Classic, this is the pinnacle of human stone age technology. And Imagine baking it so thin without breaking it. Without breaking it, they are working on both the surfaces. They are bifacial by character. So this is a very interesting development. And another important development in solutrean is the eyed needle. What is an eyed needle? You take the bones of the birds, wings of the birds. They are very thin and round. And in the back of the bird's bone, with fine, fine borer, you make a hole. And mind you, this is about 22,000 BC, you find an exact prototype of present day, present day needles, needles with a hole in the back. Exact prototype made in a bone. Now this develops in Salutrian. Along with that, you find large number of bone tools of all kinds, basically batons, all kinds of small little batons are very common in Salutrian period. So Salutrian has no bifurcation. Remember, Upper Paleolithic in Western Europe began with two traditions. And after the two traditions ends, Perigordian and Origration, Solutrean is unified and it is enigmatic. It is not say, comparable to either Origination or Perigordian for, in terms of their parentage. Now, are they developed from these? No. We come to the next. The question is, could it develop into the next? The next is called Magdalenian. 
about 19,000 or 20,000 to 8,000. So that's also quite 12,000 years duration, last of Paleolithic culture. Magdalenian, the name comes from La Magdalene site. And of course, there are six layers at Logerie Hotel. This is the first time you find that if you take a percentage count, stone tools become less than 15%, bone tools become 80%. So the shift of tools immediately goes to bone tools, hard number of low bone tools. Each of the bone tool is given engraving of some animal forms or crisscross design, art galore. Every piece is having art execution on them. And stone tools are more or less <clears throat> more or less and completely similar to perigodians. Remember, perigodians are not directly coming to Magdalenian. There is a whole lot of solutrean in between. But the perigodians at the back element and the back element gravitation point, in Magdalenian, the stone tools are basically all backed points. So you call them gravitation points. In addition to these, there are two new types that comes in Magdalenian. One <clears throat> is called raklete. Raklete is a type which compares exactly with a carom striker, carom boat striker. It's a thick flake where all along the flake, all around the circumference, you blunt it and it becomes thick. So it compares almost to the carom striker. One man asks, sir, all along our life in the cultural history, we have been working so hard to get a sharp Point. Sharpness was always desired by flaking. Why in Magdalenia everybody is doing backing or blunting? Blunting seems to be the main theme song of the day. Now the reason is very simple. And of course, along with that, both Solutrean and Magdalenian borers galore, hundreds of borers, fine borers, which are called in French epine or or, or pursuer. There are small spoke-shaped borers, borers galore. Now you can see why those bone-eyed needles require a boring, I mean imagine a bone which is from the bird's wings and that having a bored, bored hole in the posterior end, what kind of borer do you require? You require very fine borer, good enough. So you have a type called uh, uh, raclette and I will explain why it is uh, important. And then we have another type called parrot beak burin. This is almost in like a raclet, and in the raclet you give an inclined blow, then a part breaks down and a burin is formed. All along in the upper Paleolithic, you feel or you see a complete overemphasis of working with leather. Borers, leathers are over the time emphasized. And when you are cutting the skin of an animal, you require a blunt edge. If you take a sharp edge and your sharp edge you kind of scraping off the flesh from the from the from the leather, then it will cut. But you take the back side of the knife, if you can see the back side of the knife to stretch the skin, then you don't cut the skin. So raclet is specifically shown the blunting part seems to have been worked for leather working. We can't have any other explanation for this kind of a carom striker's tool that became very famous in, in Magdalenian period. Good enough, this is the French development, right, wonderful. All of them having skeletons of upper, upper Paleolithic uh, Homo sapiens sapiens. Let us go to the parts which are in south of France and let us come to uh, Spain. We do not have many good sites in Spain, but whatever we have, there we have a site called Parpalo, we have a site called Isturitz. These sites are more or less reflecting the same picture as French upper Paleolithic. The middle Paleolithic, if you remember, good and cave, they did not reflect the French pictures. And so much so that Francois Bode has to give the name, Francois Bode has to give the name of Basconian. And you go and cross the channel and go to England, you have, you come to Pinhole Cave, again there is the upper Paleolithic which is not a reflection of the French writing. So you have all along a development which shows a kind of peripheral influence the whole activity seems to be in France and a kind of peripheral influence that is getting seeped into Spain and seeped into England. Western Europe therefore shows more or less, unlike the Middle Paleolithic period, more or less shows a kind of uniformity of development. Pinhole also shows the more or less same reflection of the Solutrean and Magdalenian culture. Let us come to Central Europe. 
Central Europe also has a large number of sites, but we will pick up one site which is from Austria, very close to the city of Vienna and by the side of the river Danube or Danau. This site is called Willendorf. Willendorf is an open air site, but it is fortunately also a site which is having primary, primary habitational evidences. Willendorf has been excavated by a man called Felgenheuer and this excavation has revealed about nine cultural layers very big cultural layers and these cultural layers have shown a development which is very very peculiar. Peculiar in the sense number one, there is no erignation pedagogian difference, there is no Solutian Magdalenian difference. We were so clear cut evidences of the four traditions that we saw in France. The moment you come to Central Europe, there seems to be a mixture of all the four. I will put it this way, say layer one to layer six. Layer 1 to layer 6 is more orignesoid, more orignesoid, but typically not orignesian, but layer 7 to layer 9 are more gravitoid or upper, upper perigodian type. But then again, it is not pure upper perigodian. That means a carinated end scraper may continue here, a split base bone point may continue there. So there seems to be a mixture. What do we do with it? Well, what do we call it? Some people said, why don't you call it Orignesio Gravesian? The culture of Central European Upper Paleolithic is one tradition, call it Orignesio Gravesian. The Central Europeans said, why should we borrow French name? We won't borrow French name. We'll have our own term. And they said, we'll call it East Gravesian, referring again East of France. But that apart, the East Gravesian, the tools are Orignesian and Perigordian combined, good enough. But then there is another object which became world famous. There was about a 9 centimeter big uh, uh, stone curved into a female figurine and this was called the Venus of Willendorf. It was nicknamed, Venus is a beautiful lady, the god of beauty, but she was the god of ugliness. She was not at all beautiful, but it was given nickname as Venus of Willendorf. Of course, in archaeology we call them as, as mother goddess or female statuette. So this was very interesting. This was a figure which shows no face, basically a full head and over the face also there is a curved lines showing that it is all full of hair or hair marks. There is no neck either. There are, uh, hands are shown up to this part but there is a very big bulbous breast and even the backside is very bulbous and it shows secondary sexual traits has been exaggerated. I repeat, secondary sexual traits have been exaggerated. There is some mark, mark of ochre, uh, powder of ochre in the navel region of the lady and it seems therefore that maybe ochre was used to propitiate some kind of a religious cult, we do not know what. But this is the first time, remember, this is the first time we are getting an evidence of human mind during prehistoric period. Prehistoric period we have always had evidence of tool types, the products, the antiquities of tool types with which he must have hunted. But we never have any antiquity which refers to his anxieties, his happiness, his imperatives, his, 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 his sorrowness, all these issues of human mind which are part of non-material culture. Non-material culture we had no evidence and we accepted it. But this is the first time about 27,000 BC dated the mother goddess or the female figurine or the Venus of Willendorf first time explains that human mind had a kind of a imperative. What could be the imperative? Why secondary sexual traits? The imperative is very clear. Man is all the time worried for fertility, not human fertility. Human fertility is the worry of present day crowd. The fertility of his subsistence base. Have I eaten them all? If I don't find an animal tomorrow, then, then I have eaten them all. Will they multiply? Let the animals multiply so that I can keep eating. I can keep hunting. So the anxiety of the subsistence reproduction, the subsistence based reproduction is so big with survival that they go into something illogical if I can put it that way, rituals, cult to show that we will try to propitiate the world around us, we will try to call upon spirits, call upon facts to propitiate and, and imbibe a fertility into the world around us. Now this fertility cult is the, the 
authors, all authors more or less accept that this fertility cult must be the best evidence that we have coming from Venus of Willendorf, date 27,000 BC. So the first time we have evidence of human mind, uh, which is from the non-material culture. We go to the Balkans. I mean, Central Europe, let us say Willendorf, there are other sites, Petrana is there, but we'll not talk about it. We'll go to the Balkans. We find in Balkans also, there is no change from the Krebna Stiena group. The Krebna Stiena group of micro, micro types of tools with some blades or co, some blades, some uh, blood spits and continuing. So there is, there is no development of the kind that France is claiming. France as a luxury hood is not found anywhere. We cross further over and go to East Europe. When you go to East Europe, Molodova for instance, excellent habitational details. 27 fire hearth in one hut. So it, it seems to be a very good, well, well settled settlement site. Beautiful blade tools, but all mixed uh, gravation and pedigod uh, and ordination. You call him them of East Gravation, there is no other alternative, but bone tools galore. Beautiful bone tools, bone armlets, bone uh, 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 chains. So you have bone personal adornment objects. So you have a kind of very developed upper palatic there. Again, you have no four traditions. So you don't have this perigordian or Ignatian, Solutrean, Magdalenian as Western Europe had. Now here is in a, if you compare with your middle Paleolithic and lower Paleolithic, here again, upper Paleolithic of Europe shows a very distinct variety of development. Nobody could explain why. There's a man called Lynch, L-Y-N-C-H. He gave or he cracked a kind of opinion, nobody accepts it. He said the basic character of Upper Paleolithic is a mixture. <laughs> a mixture which can be called as East Gravation. They started from somewhere in the Middle East and started progressing towards the West. And then they came to France, there was nothing to progress further because there was the Atlantic Sea. So they got st stranded in France and once they stranded, they bifurcated into four traditions because they had no other progressions and that is why they stopped there and they had a prog they had differentiation. But rest of the Europe, they were in the ancestral form, which was a joint four characters. We do not know whether it is correct or not. But fact remains, upper Paleolithic of Europe, if you look very clearly, is showing again a difference of the four zones. I repeat again, Krevna Stiena is not luxury hood. Logerihut is not Willendorf and Willendorf is not Molodova. Thank you.